Hello, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar where we'll explore two recent MRI accident case studies from the FDA MORD database. My name is Colin Robertson, I'm Senior VP with Metrosense, and we're very excited to be hosting this webinar with John Posh and Tobias Gilk. For those of you less familiar with Metrosense, we are the leading provider of advanced magnetic detection technologies. Our Ferroguard ferromagnetic detection systems are protecting patients and staff now in 36 countries around the world. Before I hand you over to John and Toby, I have a few housekeeping items to quickly cover to make sure we all get the most out of our time today. Firstly, today's session will be available on demand after this live version. Just follow the same link as you used just now, which will also be sent to you in an email you'll receive soon after this session. Of course, please feel free to share this with any of your colleagues who are unable to attend today. I would now like to quickly take you through the various parts of the screen you're looking at now. Starting on the left side is the Q&A window. We certainly hope you'll have lots of questions for our experts today. Please enter them here. John and Toby will be addressing your questions during the second half of this webinar, and if we don't get to your question today, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. The window in the centre of the screen is where you'll see the slides throughout the webinar. If you'd like to change the sizes of any of the windows, just use the controls to the top right corner of each window. To hide or redisplay any of the individual windows on your screen, just use the buttons at the bottom of the screen. At top right, we're pleased to provide resources that you can download during this webinar. Please make sure you take a look at the infographic highlighting nine key best practices that could significantly reduce the incidence of MRI-related injuries. The final window, lower right, gives you a brief biography of John Posh and Tobias Gilk, our speakers today. And this leads me neatly to my final task, to properly introduce John and Toby to you, though I expect that they actually need little introduction. John Posh is Metrosense Director of Education for our MRI safety business. He's over 25 years of experience in MRI, firstly as a technologist and then as a trainer, educator and very respected MRI safety consultant. Toby Gilk is an architect specializing in the design of radiology facilities. He's certified as a MR safety officer and MR safety expert by the American Board of MR Safety and indeed is the chair of ABMRS for 2017-18. to 18. Toby is, of course, also one of the most widely published and quoted experts in the MR safety field. Metrosense is proud to have him as a consultant to the company. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to John Posh and Toby Gilk. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, and as we get rolling with MRI accident case studies, case study number one, um, let's learn a little bit more uh, about each of us, the presenters. This is Toby Gilk. John, if you'll say a couple of words about me, I'll return the favor and say a couple of words about you right after. Hello, my name is John Posh, and it is my pleasure to introduce my co-presenter, Tobias Gilk. Tobias is an architect with RAD Planning. He's a founding board member of the ABMRS. He's a special consultant to the MRI Safety Committee. He's the founder of Gilk Radiology Consultants, and he's a consultant to Metrosense. Thank you, John. Um, and not to belabor what Colin said uh, just a few minutes ago, um, John is Metrosense Director of Education and Director of MR Safety, MR Safety Officer. Um, he is MRI safety consultant to Metrosense clients um, and has been an educator in MR in general and MR safety in specific for a number of years. Um, John is also, um, probably has the distinction of having scanned the most interesting stuff of any MR tech that, that I know in the world. Um, and his abiding interest in MR safety and his really extensive experience, um, I can think of nobody better to, to help pick apart these case studies. So with that, let's roll on into it. So uh, before we really start rolling into the meat and potatoes of this, let's, let's give everybody sort of the 30,000-foot view, the outline of what we think you are going to learn from this. 
Um, there is an enormous value in looking at accident events, near miss events, good catch events, to try and identify the, the routes through which accidents can happen. Um, because if we know better the ways in which accidents can happen, we can actually go back and take a look and make sure that our policies, procedures, daily practices um, do what we think they do, that, that they interrupt the, the paths of accidents. So we study other people's mistakes so that we can learn from their mistakes and we don't have to replicate them ourselves to draw the lesson. Um, we're also going to really cover about, in the, in the presentation, the bits and pieces of the MR provider, the hospitals, the imaging centers, the polyclinics, your unique role in terms of um, accident reporting. Um, and all of this is really geared towards an end goal of reducing the risks of accident, reducing the likelihood of accident um, in MR. So with that as sort of the, the, the roadmap, let's roll. Okay, so step one in the webinar, I guess, now that we understand our objectives, is, uh, you know, that the title of this is Learning from the MOD Database. So, so what is MOD? Well, apart from the world's worst acronym ever. Absolutely, no question about it. MOD is the Manufacturer and User Facility Device Experience the experience being the interesting part there, and you'll see why when we get into it. So quite simply, MOD is a publicly searchable interface for the United States MedWatch reporting system, which is a, a division of the United States Food and Drug Administration. And it covers all FDA-regulated medical devices. It's not just uh, MRIs. Now, MRI is what we're focusing on today, but you could also look up CTs or any other uh, uh, devices, medical devices that are regulated by the FDA in this database. Now that we know what MOD is, I guess the, the next logical question, and we would like your responses, um, have you personally ever searched the MOD database looking for MRI accidents, adverse events? Um, so please click the radio button that best fits your answer. So if you have looked something up in the last few years on MOD um, specific to MRI accidents, click the first button. If you think maybe but it was a long time ago, my memory's kind of fuzzy, click the second option. If you know you've never searched for an MRI adverse event report on the MOD database, click the last one. Nope. Um, you have to enter your responses on this screen. I'll give you just a minute more to select the ones that you want, and we will see what your answers are here in just a few minutes. And the next one will give you a little bit less time because you will understand what, what this is and how it works, but uh, five, four, three, two, one. All right, and we're moving on. So this is the user interface page for the, the MOD database device experience. Um, the web access address is down below at the bottom of the slide for anyone that wants to check in this afterwards. So as you can see from the interface, it's, it's typically what you would expect from the FDA. It is comprehensive, it's detailed, it's just a little bit fuzzy around the edges, but <laughs> in the end, it works really well. So you can search by product problem, so you can search device failure or, or device malfunction. You can search by product class if you know that or event type. Um, but in my experience, and I'm sure Toby would agree, the most common search criteria is always the date. Mm -hmm. So someone will put in January 1st, 2012 and, and put an end date of December 31st, 2013, and then they'll have a, you know, a however long uh, summary of all the events that were reported. Now, you need to filter it down by product code, which is MRI, CT, you know, whatever other devices. Otherwise, you're going to have a really large data set to sort through. Uh, but, you know, it's not that difficult. And, and actually, um, and again, I know Toby agrees here. He'll nod. He's nodding. Like, you can't see him. <laughs> and uh, 
So go into this. Log in and, and do a test search. Just put it in for a, a one or two month period and see what comes up in MRI and look at the types of reports that are in there and the types of devices that are reported and that kind of information. Because, you know, as, as Toby said, one of our objectives in this webinar is learning your role as a healthcare practitioner in, uh, in reporting device, device complications or malfunctions or failures or device-related accidents to the FDA. So seeing samples of what's in there is going to be very important in your learning curve on how to do that. So what kind of events need to be reported to MAUD? Well, it, it kind of depends on who you are. So um, manufacturers are required to report any device malfunction that results in death or serious injury or a device malfunction that did not result in death or injury but could do so if that malfunction were to repeat itself. So yes, something broke, it didn't work as it was designed, but no one was injured. However, if that happens again, it could be bad. That is required to be reported. Now, device and user facilities, which is essentially everybody on this call, you know, the end users, the, the hospitals, the, the people who do the, the, the real work, um, important plug to us text, um, <laughs> report to both the FDA and the manufacturer when we suspect a device-related death. If we suspect a device-related serious injury, that can be reported to either the FDA or the manufacturer. And it's uh, worth noting that these are sort of the, the, the floor, the minimum requirements, um, but obviously facilities, um, the more information we can share about adverse events and mishaps, uh, the better informed we will all be. Exactly, exactly. This is what has to be done, but there's much more that can be done. And, and as we know from everything related to safety, unless we take this ownership of this and we, we grassroots it, it'll never happen. So report everything. Let's get this database where it needs to be, and, and it'll, it'll benefit all of us. So as John was explaining what needs to get reported and how the what actually ties back to the who, who needs to report. Let's break down their three separate categories of required reporting for FDA and the MAUD database. And the first of those that we'll look at is manufacturers. Um, as John mentioned, if, if a patient dies as a result of a negative interaction with the device, the manufacturer has to report that. The other criteria, and this is one that's really bizarre for MRI, is device malfunction. Um, I say bizarre because projectile-related injuries, for example, of something that goes flying at the magnet or flying at the patient inside the magnet, um, that's not a device malfunction. That's the device acting the way it's supposed to. And in fact, if we look at projectiles and burns and hearing damage, the three most prevalent uh, MR-related injuries that get reported to the FDA, in most cases, those are because the device is functioning properly. Um, so when it says device malfunction, we in MR need to kind of reinterpret that. Um, even if it's not a device malfunction, but it is a specifically recognized hazard associated with the device, those are ones that should get reported. The second group that has a reporting obligation um, are importers. Um, this, as John mentioned when he was describing what MAUD covers, and it covers all manner of medical devices. Um, so it might be talking about a urinary catheter that's imported from Bangladesh. Um, with MR equipment, essentially they're U.S. manufacturers, or even if the corporate headquarters are somewhere in Europe or Asia or whatever, it's a U.S. organization. The company has a presence here. So importers for MR, uh, at least in terms of the MRI device itself, is really not relevant to us. So we're going to skip past this. Which brings us to you, um, end users, hospitals, imaging centers, that sort of thing. Um, so, as John mentioned, if a patient dies or is seriously injured, uh, you as an institution have to report that to the FDA directly. Um, if there's the likelihood of an injury or a likelihood of an injury becoming serious, that 
can be directly reported to the FDA. Um, frequently, however, it is reported through the manufacturer, and then the manufacturer takes that information and crafts what becomes the report to the FDA. Those are the minimums. Um, as mentioned, anything we can do above and beyond the minimum to share information that helps other people prevent accidents is a good thing um, and something we would like to see much more of. So here are the results from the first popcorn question, a question asking whether you personally had looked something up an MRI adverse event on the MOD database. Um, Oh, okay. Um, we will we'll, we'll discuss this further during the Q and A session, but we wanted to kind of share with you what everybody's experience was. So, thank you. And now we will move on. So, so why is adverse adverse event reporting so important? Well, it's simple. When, when mistakes happen, we need to learn from them for several reasons. Most importantly by studying the mistakes made by ourselves and others, it gives us a better understanding of the causes of those mistakes so that we can identify areas for improvement, mitigate risk wherever possible, and put processes in place that prevent recurrence of these, these incidents. Uh, the key to this process, in my opinion, is the sharing of information. And on that note, it's important to remember two things. One, reporting an accident to MAUD is anonymous and all your information is legally protected from discovery. You're not outing yourself. You're not putting you or your facility at risk. That is not the case. Reporting is safe and confidential. And two, reporting industry incidents is an industry best practice and failure to report could impact your facility's ACR accreditation. And our second audience feedback question, um, has your site ever reported an MRI adverse event or an MRI near miss good catch event to the MOD database? Either directly reported it to the FDA or reported it to your manufacturer or vendor uh, for them to report. So if you know, yes, we have, click the first option. No, we haven't, click the second option. Or if you're not sure whether you would even know whether an adverse event was ever reported at your site, click the third option. We'll give you just a moment more to finalize your selections. And okay, we are moving on. So let's jump into the first of the two case studies that we're going to take a look at here. Um, and this one is a burn event. And what you see on the screen two things. One, the screen captured directly from the MOD database on the web, and so you see the results like you would see if you actually did the search. Um, and the second at the bottom is the URL that if you wanted to click and go directly to this event, um, there's a, an event ID number that allows for direct web linking. But the text on this is just way too small. Let's actually blow it up so that people can see it and read it. So here we've just simply retyped the information that you saw on the, the previous slide, and here we've retyped it so that it's actually legible, readable. Um, I'm going to give you just a moment uh, to read through this. Um, we're going to highlight some of the key things on subsequent slides, so if you don't get all the way through it, that's okay. Um, the long and short of this was you know, a patient who receives a burn, um, sedated patient, large patient, wrapped in a sheet, Anyway, I'll give you just a moment to read through it, and then we will advance to the analysis piece of it. Jeopardy theme, just imagine it in the background. All right, and again, if you didn't get all the way through it, don't worry, because we're going to highlight some of the key pieces of it um, as John takes over some of the analysis on our next slide. Okay, so now that everyone's had a chance to, to review the report, at least sort of summarily, let, let's do a couple things. Um, I, when I look at these reports, I like to, I like to list um, different factors, right? I like to look at the intrinsic factors of the event. The intrinsic factors um, for this case are the patient is thick in body habitus, has no room in the bore for sponges, and the patient required anesthesia. 
as a quick review, intrinsic factors are the things that are beyond our control, but we still need to take them into consideration. Just because we can't control them doesn't mean that they can't impact us at, at times quite negatively, as this patient found out. Um, so by, by listing them, I think it's, it's better to it's, it, it allows us to better understand how they could be possible failure points. Um, then let's look at the extrinsic factors. The extrinsic factors in this case are the ones that we can control. Those are highlighted in green. The intrinsic were highlighted in blue. Sorry, I forgot to mention that little detail. The green ones are the extrinsic. Those are the things that we can control. Those are the steps that we may have taken to keep this patient safe. So this patient was mummified with a blanket and sheet, uh, and they were kept from touching the sides of the bore. And, and while those are good things, um, you know, they're, in this case, probably weren't enough. And that leads us to our last little category of analysis, which is highlighted in red. And these are what I call the false sense of security. So in this case, the scan was stopped to check the patient several times, and the patient was always covered with a sheet or a blanket. So... Uh, that brings me to a couple of two, two specifically critical questions. One, how did the site check a mummified patient for focal heating from near field or proximity effects? And two, how is covering a patient with a sheet or blanket an effective barrier to prevent burns? And that's the learning point from this. We then have to discuss this, and Toby, please feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. Is a sheet or blanket an effective barrier? and is simply pulling the patient out and looking at them and asking if they're okay an effective countermeasure to prevent a near field or proximity burn. And particularly when the patient is sedated or anesthetized. Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> so but, so the, the, the takeaway from this is not for us to say, this is what happened and this is why. Because in truth, that's not really, uh, while it's part of the goal of this webinar, our goal is not to say what exactly happened, what was right, what was wrong. Our goal is to talk about how we can learn from what was done before, how we can take this as an example and say, but I had a patient who required anesthesia and I wrapped them in a blanket as well, and that was, that was how I made sure they were safe. Well, in truth, that's simply not enough. This patient suffered a near field or proximity burn, more than likely, um, which would not have resulted in local pain initially if that burn, if the energy was deposited in the subcutaneous fat where there are no nerve receptors, the patient would not have felt pain immediately. Uh, if they did feel minor discomfort, they wouldn't have been able to convey that because they were under anesthesia. Um, and that barrier that they put in place, that sheet of blanket, was clearly not effective. Uh, so that's our that's our sort of analysis of case number one. Toby, is there anything you'd like to add before we go on to like talking about the the type of report and how this report is beneficial and the and the we sort of give the report a grade, if you will. We'll get there. Yeah, that, I I think you've hit on the major points. Um, uh, it's it's important that we understand what causation, what the routes of causation of accidents and injuries are, um, and not simply, you know, well, when I was trained, they told me to make sure there was a sheet between the patient and the border wall. Um, if, if you don't understand why somebody says there should be a sheet between the patient and the bore wall, um, then you really can't answer the question as to whether a sheet or a blanket is really the appropriate thing to prevent near field effect burns. Um, in this case, if you referred to your operator's manual, I think every single MR system operator's manual will say a sheet or a blanket is not sufficient to prevent near field effect burns. And that's why the systems are sold with um, bore wall padding um, and that there's a minimum separation requirement, um, sometimes as little as, you know, like five millimeters, half a centimeter, and sometimes as much as a centimeter, depending on your system and the system requirements. Um, but, um, you know, you are not going to find a bed sheet or a single layer blanket that's going to get you that minimum separation. Exactly. So before we go further, I think it's important that we kind of identify the particulars of the reporting circumstance. This event, this burn event, uh, was actually reported by the user facility, the, the hospital. Um, and 
as you will see, unusually, this includes a level of detail about the exam information, uh, potential risk factors, uh, outcome and results uh, that don't always appear in MOD adverse event reports. Um, also, interestingly, because this was a hospital-based or outpatient imaging center-based uh, report, it does not include uh, information from the manufacturer. And you'll see why that's an important distinction here. So let's ask ourselves a couple of key questions here, key points. If the patient was wrapped in a sheet, how could a burn have occurred? This is a discussion you should have at your site. So when, when, you're, when, when you take this information back to your site after today's webinar, you know, this is a discussion point. If the patient was wrapped in a sheet, how did the burn occur? The patient was clearly not in physical contact with the bore. There were no leads. There were no patches. There were no other electrical conductors mentioned. So again, how could that burn have occurred? And this is something that I think all MR techs need to understand clearly. How did the thermal energy get deposited in that patient's tissue in sufficient quantities such as to cause a burn. And then last point is, the burn was because the patient was sedated. If they'd been awake, would that have prevented it? They could have said, ow, this burns. Um, let's stop. It, it hurts. Um, and, and is that really the case? That's another discussion point. What are the learning points from this incident? How can we prevent these from happening at our own site? So next time you have a patient who is coming in for sedation, is going to be wrapped in a sheet, is going to be under anesthesia, how can you prevent this from happening again? Because our goal is always prevention. Cleaning up after a bomb explodes is damage control. Preventing it from going off, that's the stuff we want to do. We always want to prevent the bomb from going off. So ultimately, if the goal is to reduce accidents or injuries, um, we need to take apart the causal roots of the event that we're studying, identify the ways in which we can interrupt that particular element of causation or reduce the likelihood of a negative outcome from that particular part. So prevention. John was just talking about keeping the bomb from going off in the first place. Okay. So how do we prevent the bomb from going off in this instance where we burn the patient from a near field effect? Well, if the patient is not sufficiently near to the transmit RF source, that's an effective means of prevention, um, providing padding that keeps the minimum separation as defined by your MR system vendor. Um, now in this case, we had a patient with a large body habitus, so maybe Maybe there really was no effective way to provide the padding and get the study done. So if that's the case, then we move to our, sort of our second tier, and that's risk mitigation. Um, and patients are burned based on the amount of power we put in their body and how quickly we do that and over what period of time we're pumping power into their body. So if we can control those factors, if we can reduce the SAR or B1RMS associated with the pulse sequence that we're administering, um, we reduce either total energy or power or both uh, that we're putting into the patient, um, and we can mitigate the risks and reduce the likelihood of adverse event, adverse outcomes. Exactly. And, and it's interesting to note, one of the things we didn't focus on in the report quite yet, and I'm not sure we will in the future, but we're bringing it up now, is if you look about halfway down, the, the scanning, the patient was scanned for 90 minutes. Now, for, for a modern study under anesthesia, we could say, well, that's not a lot, but, but objectively, 90 minutes is a lot of time for scanning. So take this as a learning point that in future cases, if you're, if you're running up against a scan that's 90 minutes, focus on low SAR sequences, focus on B1 modulation techniques, focus on our production strategies. Always be mindful that, you know, you're, 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 you have a mass normalized rate of deposition of energy into the patient's tissue, SAR. You have a cumulative energy dose set, and those are fixed. You can't go beyond them. So you should plan accordingly because obviously the lower the RF energy, the less are the chance of, of these injuries happening. It's the learning point here. So if we had to give a grade to this report that was filed by this facility, how, how did they do overall? How, what grade would we give this report? Well, 
in discussion this, Toby and I came up with an answer that we think we give them a, a solid B. Um, and the reason for the solid B is there's some key data missing that, that would have made this report more detailed and more um, useful for uh, really truly deep diving what happened here. For example, knowing the exam performed and COIL used would have been beneficial, as would the SAR and SED readings for this patient's exam. And lastly, they say that blankets and sheets were used, but blankets and sheets are a pretty vague description of the linens. You know, what was the thickness of the linens that was used? What was their condition when the patient came out of the bore? Was the patient, was the patient dry? Was the patient sweaty? Were the sheets soaked? All these things would have been beneficial pieces of information. And they're not the kind of thing that you sort of automatically sort of just, oh, yeah, that should be included in the report. It, it's kind of almost a little counterintuitive. You've got to think, you got to think like you're almost always, when you're filing a report, like what you're going to be able to dissect out of it or defend later. What questions could someone ask you based on the report that you're filing? Not that it's based on a legal case, because we said earlier, these are anonymous, they are present, protected from discovery, but, but think defensively. How could you defend this report if someone questioned you on it? And here we have the results of the audience feedback question we asked you just a few minutes ago um, about whether your site had reported an MRI adverse event or near miss good catch event to the FDA MAW database. So I'll give you just a minute to see what your colleagues are saying. Um, and as before, as with the earlier question, um, if we want to explore this, we will dive a little bit deeper into it during the Q&A. All right, here we go. So let's look at our second case for this webinar. Report number two is a projectile injury case. This time, we have a report that was generated by the device manufacturer. And we'll look at both the device manufacturer's component of that report and the secondhand information they got from the site that they reported as part of their report to the FDA. So this is the manufacturer's narrative of what happened in case number two. What can we learn from this? Well, in truth, very little. Um, if we look at the stuff that's sort of highlighted in yellow, we can see that the system was working, the site had safety training, and the instructions for use made it clear that magnets attract metal. So this is the manufacturer saying, our, our stuff was working as it should. This was clearly not our fault. And, you know, the site was trained. So this is, this is, this is absolute erudite deflection. Um, and, and it's a difficult report to learn anything from with respect to the manufacturer's narrative. So we're going to have to take a look at the secondhand description of the events and see if there's anything there, because what we have from the manufacturer in the primary report is not really useful. So one of the things that caught our eye about this particular event is that it's a pistol that goes flying at the magnet and shoots the patient. Um, as John just pointed out, the information we get from the manufacturer is largely not our fault, not our problem. Um, so we have to kind of go to the piece of this that the manufacturer copies and pastes from the, the site. Um, and they talk about patient entering the suite with a loaded weapon in his pants pocket, um, drawn to the magnet discharge, shooting the patient in the leg. Um, the patient was told to remove everything and that apparently or purportedly the patient said, yeah, I did what you told me to do. So um, the intrinsic factors, uh, the things that we're presented with, well, obviously the MRI has a magnetic field, tends to be what the M stands for in MRI. Um, and we start out with a, a patient who is armed, who has something ferromagnetic that is dangerous if brought into the MR environment. Um, so the extrinsic factors. Given what we are provided with as inputs, what can we control? Well, um, they allowed the patient to go in in street clothes. Um, they didn't have a change policy for, for the patient. Um, they didn't have a ferromagnetic detection system um, to screen the patient either as a part of the, the zone two screening process or um, as sort of a doorway, catch the patient before they enter the room. Um, and to the red items, the, the false sense of security bullets. Um, 
So they say, well, we told the patient to do this, and the patient said, well, yeah, I followed your instructions. Um, that's anybody who spends any time kind of looking at, at human factors, uh, human behavior, and, and, and the contributions of human behavior to accidents and adverse events, we should know. We should all be better at this. Um, we should know that patients don't always pay attention to the questions that we're asking them. They give answers because they know that giving an answer is a necessary step to get what they want next, not necessarily that they're giving you an answer that really responds to the question you're asked or that they're fully aware of it or that maybe they're just trying to conceal something that they don't want to tell you about. Um, so patient responses, patient information kind of needs to be treated with a little bit of suspicion, which is why, going back to the extrinsic factors, um, best practices say change your patients. Um, screen your patients with her magnetic detection systems to make sure that either they're telling you the truth or that you catch things when they don't tell you the truth or are not fully disclosing of potential risk factors. So if we look at the structure of case study number two, the report, we, we notice a couple of things. First, the report was made by the manufacturer. It describes the event in minimal detail and leaves out key information. Secondly, it doesn't include any narrative or first-hand information from the user facility. As such, this, this report has a lot less information that we can use uh, based on facts, and we have, to, we have to learn from it in other ways. So as we discussed in case one, in learning from any adverse event, the, the key question should always be how can I prevent this or at least how can I lower the chances of it happening again? So in case two, we, we really don't have a lot of facts, but we can make some inferences, and in this case, the inferences are fairly effective. First, it really is an industry best practice that all patients be screened for the presence of ferromagnetic material and changed into hospital supplied scrubs or gowns. There is no facility that could argue against that as a best practice. Now, the site claims the patient was screened and either forgot about or chose not to disclose that he was carrying a weapon. Um, if the patient was properly attired and the screening process included ferromagnetic detection either in zone two uh, as a patient screener or zone uh, three to detect ferrous objects approaching the zone four door as recommended by the ACR, this event would most likely not have happened. So in this case, we have the countermeasures in place, right? We know how to, how to prevent or mitigate devices, incidents like this from happening. We just have to stick to our own best practices. And I think that's, that's an incredibly important takeaway point from this. So particularly when we compare this case study number two, the, the pistol projectile accident against the burn one, as John pointed out, we got some differences based on the reporting structure and that this one was really submitted by and through the, the manufacturer of the MR system as opposed to the provider directly submitting it. These things really, in this case at least, produce some pretty significant differences in the value of the information, both quality and quantity. Um, overall, this is a D, a D plus in terms of information. There is just enough to kind of hang our hat on, the, you know, this, this is a big enough, egregious enough mishap um, that it doesn't take a whole lot of data for us to, to take away some lessons. So it's not completely worthless, and there are some completely worthless ones on the mod, um, but it's, it's closer to worthless than, than high value. Um, we don't really understand how the patient was screened, what the facility... Um, standards were, uh, we don't understand whether you know, the patient was requested to change or even given the option to change and, and elected to proceed in street clothes, um, what their, their patient checking process was for pocket material and that sort of thing. We don't know any exactly. of that. Exactly. Exactly. So, and it's interesting, it's interesting to note that the one piece of hard data that we do have is that the machine was functioning properly. <laughs> if the patient was electrocuted, that's important to know, but for a projectile injury, it's not all that important. 
Right, which goes to what we were talking about earlier, the, the strangeness about the reporting requirements really, in a lot of cases, being keyed to device malfunction. Um, yep. MR, we hurt patients all the time, unfortunately, with perfectly functional equipment, and it's actually because of the function of the equipment that we wind up hurting patients. That's why these processes and best practice protections are just so essential to safe patient care. So although this webinar only looked at two case studies, it really, this is not a deep dive exhaustive study, but I think we can come up with a, a good moral of the story here. First, it is vital that we learn from one another. We cannot all be independent. We cannot all be siloed. We must learn from collective mistakes of our industry and take steps to prevent them from happening again. Second, we can absolutely provide a fuller event understanding if sites report MRI safety events and near misses, what we also call good catches, because it really isn't a near miss. It's a good catch. Something didn't happen. Um, and if we provide more rich data, more details, more of the kind of things that we as users of this equipment and, and the people directly responsible for patient care need to know, the database can, in fact, become a much more useful tool. So in wrapping up, the, before we get to your, your questions, um, I think it's just really important that we thank you for taking the time from your schedule. Nobody gets paid to, to, to learn about other people's mistakes. These are things that we take on because of our professional responsibility. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of Mattresense. Thank you on behalf of Gilk Radiology Consultants. And with that, we get to possibly the most anticipated part of this, we would like to take your questions. Many thanks, Toby and John, for that illuminating session. Before we move on to the Q&A, I just want to ensure that everyone has noticed the resources area at the top right of your screen. Please do download the valuable infographic that highlights simple risk mitigation factors that address most frequently reported MRI adverse incidents, including the sort of things we've been talking about this afternoon. Also, if you haven't visited already, please visit the Metrosense Resource Center, which contains lots of additional MR safety resources. So unsurprisingly, we've had a steady stream of questions coming in over the past 40 minutes. Uh, if you haven't already asked yours, then please do so. Um, please do so using the, uh, the, the question uh, section down the bottom left. And if we don't manage to get to yours during this live session, we'll certainly follow up afterwards. Now, we certainly do have time to answer some of the questions. So let's start with, let me just put up my question. Let's start with this one. So what proportion of MRI accidents actually get reported to MAUD? Uh, that, that's a great question and one that we really don't have a good answer for. Um, uh, there has been no QAQC that we're aware of um, in terms of you know, the FDA looking at MAUD adverse event reports. Um, there are there are things that we can do to kind of compare it to other reporting systems that suggest that MOD reporting rates are in the low single-digit percentages. Um, so we know that, you know, whatever we're capturing is a very slim minority of the actual, you know, breadth and depth of, of adverse events that are occurring. Um, um, and we can make some educated guesses as to, to what that is, but the, the, the short answer to the question is we don't know. Thanks, Toby. Uh, next one on a similar vein. Can I report an event that did not result in an injury or death? I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, the only way the MOD database is ever going to be uh, useful as a tool for us to, to learn and improve is if all adverse events get reported. Even something that did not result in death or serious injury, it's still important that we learn from what happened. 
Um, the fact that, you know, an adverse event occurred, something flew into the magnet and no one was hit uh, is, is quite fortuitous. But that doesn't mean that that event could be repeated by someone else who had a similar situation. And we should absolutely take an opportunity to learn from those. Yeah, which means everybody who experiences adverse events, near miss, good catch events, we would encourage them to, to share the, the particulars of their event so that we can all you know, benefit from, from more information about how these events occur and, and how to prevent them. Thanks, both of you. Just just following on the same sort of theme on, on what should be reported and what shouldn't, uh, the question that came in is, when you state device malfunction, does this also include drugs? So should people also be reporting potential incidents or potential incidents around contrast media? Yes, absolutely. Eh, eh. Go ahead, Toby. I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to say that anything that's, that's FDA regulated, which is drugs and devices. Now, the MOD database, the medical device recording database that we see MOD as the output of, doesn't that database doesn't capture the, the drug side of things. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, but yes, if there are any adverse events uh, associated with the use of FDA approved drugs, uh, those ought to be reported as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, we've had a number of questions about how people use the MORD database and how people get access to the data. Um, one of the things that we're getting frequently asked is uh, people during the webinar have been trying to, uh, to do a search, as you suggest, and somebody's asked, not able to find any accidents when I enter either MR or MRI into the product code. Does this mean there weren't any accidents during that period or, or am I doing something wrong? <laughs> um, there most definitely were MR accidents uh, in any period more than you know a few days. Uh, the hundreds of them get reported annually. Um, the, so the product code, um, the FDA uses a three-letter designation for every FDA-approved medical device. Um, and one would think, logically, the three-letter product code for MRI would be MRI. Um, unfortunately, the FDA doesn't agree with that logic. Um, and so the three-letter product code for MR devices is LNH, Larry Nancy Henry. Um, so if you are running your search and you define, you know, the particular types of accidents you're looking for and the date range to get just the MRI adverse events, you need to put in LNH as the product code. Thanks very much, Toby. I think that's going to be really useful to people. Um, next one, uh, thinking about... Um, what people report and what people don't report, a question that just come in uh, in the last couple of minutes. Do you have to ask permission from the hospital before reporting a near miss? What if they do not allow you to report it? Do you guys have any that's advice actually, for people on that? That's actually a very interesting question, and I'd like to say that no hospital would um, have some sort of prohibition against reporting adverse events but I've been around long enough to recognize the fact that there is absolutely an institution out there somewhere that, that discourages the practice. Um, I, I, I hesitate to give advice on that other than to say you, you have to determine what's important to you. Um, from my, my standpoint, my opinion is all uh, adverse events must be reported, and if you are discouraged from transparency and reporting to the appropriate regulatory agencies, um, I, I, I would I would check with hospital counsel. To be honest, I would escalate that above the person telling you not to report because that that is not the standard of care, it is not the standard of practice, and it is not the way a department should be run. And further on, on that point, um, individual facilities may want to funnel adverse events information through a regulatory or compliance officer or a safety officer or something like that. Um, so apart from the question of does a facility actively discourage adverse event reporting, 
there, the facility may want to make sure that they institutionally have their arms around scope and nature of different problems and therefore may want adverse event reporting to go through a single office. Um, uh, as John said with the question of do you report directly or not, um, this is another one where I think it's important to identify your facility's process and procedure uh, for it and that may require um, having a conversation with your compliance officer. Okay, many thanks. Um, we have a number of, a good number, I think, of, uh, of uh, people who have joined us from outside the US, uh, a number of people from Europe and elsewhere. Um, and uh, one of the questions that's coming in is, I'm from Europe, can I report uh, things onto Maud? Should I report things onto Maud? I, I uh, think, ahead, you know, I, yeah, I was just going to say that you know, the, the, the contributing factors that, that lead to injuries, accidents, um, are not peculiar to United States boundaries, borders, or, or elsewhere. The, the FDA may be a little fussy about, you know, inviting reports from, from the world. Um, some of the manufacturers, however, report um, adverse events that occur in countries other than the United States, I, I believe that they feel compelled to do so when the product that's sold in Europe or Asia or Africa or wherever, um, if that product is fundamentally equivalent to a product that's sold in the United States, um, then you know, the argument is it's the same product. It, it should be subject to reporting. There are um, adverse event reports from outside the United States in the MOD database. Um, um, and I would encourage for the purpose of information sharing and, and allowing us to learn as much as possible from one another, I encourage everybody um, to, to share this information in a public forum um, and to the best of my knowledge, the FDA MOD database is probably the today the best option for doing that. I agree. Thanks, Toby. Um, next one, what are the most common MRI adverse events? John, you want to? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, I'm actually reading the questions that are coming in. I'm fascinated by the amount of questions that are being asked. Um, this is clearly the, the, the most talented and intelligent audience we've ever had. Um, so, uh, you know, I, projectiles are never number one. Projectiles happen on a somewhat regular basis. When they, when they go public, they tend to uh, be big news because they tend to be the larger things that are harder to hide. Um, but lots of small projectiles happen on a daily basis, you know, paper clips, small pocket things. Those kind of things go in on a regular basis. They're just no one talks about it. They're removed by hand. And, and you walk away whistling and pretend it never happened. Um, in terms of what gets reported most to MAUD, um, if my memory is correct, it's, it's burns with, with the hearing loss being a close second. Um, Toby, if you have a different opinion, pop, please pop in. But the, the interesting thing about these, and if you, if you look at, regardless of how they're explained and how they're reported and the details that's provided, the thing about hearing injuries is they are 100% preventable simply providing the patient with hearing protection in the form of appropriate earplugs and or noise dampening headsets will eliminate all, burn, all, all hearing incidents. There's no reason not to do that. With burns, they are virtually 100% preventable with proper positioning, proper padding, and proper isolation techniques so that the patients are thermally and electrically isolated at all times. Um, so, it, it burns in hearing loss, um, and, and they're the top two reported events are 100% preventable. This is, this is you know, it's, it's really mind-boggling how we still have these discussions, yet we do on a daily basis. Thanks, John. Um, lots and lots of questions specifically around the case studies. We've only got a few minutes left, but just, just to pick up on a couple of them and we will get back to all the other questions that have been asked after this after this event. 
But uh, we've got a question on, should we not scan patients that are large enough, or sorry, too large essentially, that you can't get padding around them, and so they're going to touch the bore? What happens if you have a big patient and they're going to touch the bore? Yeah, and, and that's, that's a fantastic question because it's something that every MRI tech faces at some point. You're going to have a patient that comes that's going to be very tight in the bore, and with work you can get them in, but not if there's extra padding. So it becomes a risk-benefit assessment. What is the benefit of the test that you're doing, and do those benefits have the potential to alter the treatment course, the outcome, the decision-making, to the point that they outweigh the potential risks of scanning a patient who is tight up against the bore with their arms touching, their thighs touching, and, and you know, potential conductive loop, conductive body loops. And that's a decision that you have to make in conjunction with your radiologist. In, in truth, the radiologist makes the, the decision, but they're going to get the information necessary to make that decision from you, the technologist. And, and we should probably also mention that it's not simply a, a you know, a stop-go type of decision. Um, as we explored in the case study that we looked at, if the decision is to go forward, if there's a compelling reason, you know, to go forward with the exam, um, there are things that we can do to mitigate the potential harm as a result of it. If we have a large patient and we decide, yeah, this patient really could benefit from this study, um, it's not simply throw them in the bore and, and do your canned um, pulse sequences. You may want to tailor the pulse sequences and reduce the total RF energy deposition, which will excuse me will reduce the potential for thermal injury. If we're just putting less energy into the patient, there's less of an opportunity for it to concentrate um, in in the body of the patient and cause an injury. So uh, the the degree to which we have control over some of the factors should really play into um, the, the risk-benefit decision because there are extrinsic factors and there are intrinsic factors um, um, and manipulate and, and, and work with everything that you can to, uh, to reduce the potential risk of harm uh, for that patient. Agreed. Thanks both for that. Um, and just we've got, I think, just time for one more question. Um, and I'll just take a question from uh, related to the second uh, case study that we talked about. Um, and the question is: Should all patients be wanded with a metal detector before going into Zone Four? Uh, well, excellent question. Um, wanding with a metal detector is a very dangerous statement because metal detectors are specifically not approved for use uh, for MRI. What we're talking about is ferromagnetic detection only. Those are the ones that are approved. Secondly, with respect to hand wands, a hand wand is less effective for screening a patient um, than a whole body screener. And the reason for that is they have a smaller area of sensitivity. It, 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 there's a large inter-user variability um, for reproducibility, and they quite simply can't cover the entire patient's body. They're, they're a little invasive. You've got to get real close to the patient, spend a lot of time. They're useful for um, uh, characterizing known implants, but that's really the extent of it. So wanding patients before they go in is not generally an appro a good idea, in my opinion. I, I prefer a whole body, ferrous-only detection system. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, folks, well, I'm afraid we've got to the end of our time today. Um, so I'd like to say, first of all, a huge thanks to, uh, to Toby and John, and, and a big thanks, of course, also to everyone who's joined us uh, on the call today. We're going to make this MAUD MRI safety case study review a regular event. Um, so we're looking to do it uh, quarterly at least. Um, so please look out for an invitation um, for the next one. You will receive an email later today with a link to join this webinar again on demand. So, and, and please do forward that to any of your colleagues who might have missed out in this live session. Many thanks again, and, uh, and goodbye until next time.